Well, tonight we find ourselves uh, in the hallowed uh, hall, the lecture theatre of the Royal Geographical Society. This is where the likes of Robert Falcon Scott and Ernest Shackleton and uh, more recently Ranulph Fiennes have been, have drunk coffee, have supped wine and spoken. But tonight we have Major Keith Reesby and Josh Lucy who have just been up on stage lecturing to uh, many interesting followers about their time climbing Everest. Um, and obviously chaps, uh, Keith, you've uh, experienced some very frightening uh, times uh, over in Afghanistan and elsewhere on duty in the army and, and Josh, you've uh, stepped out in a World Cup final in front of a whole nation willing you on to win. So you, you've done nerves, you know what it's like. How did tonight compare? Well, I was petrified. <laughs> and uh, at the moment, it's just relief, to be quite honest. It was a, it was a real privilege, and I understood that. But to be quite honest, a few hours ago, I, I was wishing it to be over. But now, sitting back, uh, I was pleased with how it went. We seemed to get a good response. Uh, and and, and a, a full house for, for combat stress, more importantly. Yeah, I think from my point of view, I think the, the aim of the talk tonight was to say that in, in respect of the RGS, this isn't in any way the names you've just used, Shackleton, etc. You know, they're on a different radar from ourselves. We just did a little trip for ourselves to raise some money for charity and we talked through some of what we learnt uh, for other people if we wanted to go and do that trip. So. To, to, to use the same to use guys in the same sentence is a little is a little bit misleading, but uh, it was certainly uh, I think it was educational tonight, and uh, we had a few laughs, and it's quite enjoyable. No, it was a thoroughly uh, entertaining and interesting, and, and at, si at times harrowing uh, lecture that that you gave. Um, uh, we've only got a few minutes, but just talk us through your your Everest experience and uh, what happened at the end, and and how you feel about it now. Well, in reverse order, how we feel about it, I think we had an amazing experience. I think it was, uh, both felt hand and heart quite content. Um, Walter Modati once said that so the mountains are the means, the man is the end, the aim is not to summit the mountain but to improve the man. Well, in terms of experiences and the more you know, cultures you experience, the better you are, the more you learn, it was certainly along those lines. I think we, in terms of, we touch on within the, the lecture, you know, why neither Keith nor I touch the top. Um, and, and being for factors outside your own control, those being frustrating, but that's the nat nature of mountaineering. And uh, what we can both do is put a hand on hand our heart, knowing that it wasn't through lack of effort. Now, let's be honest, you both got agonisingly close to that summit. And uh, who knows, you probably would have made that summit with a little bit of luck. But luck is something in the end that, uh, that didn't go, go your way. Perhaps you'd like to briefly explain what happened. Uh, well, for me, we, we started summit day uh, as intended. Uh, we, we had the weather window that had been forecast. Uh, we set off at 10.30 in the evening um, on what was meant to be a 13-hour sort of push to the summit. Uh, Josh was going quicker than I was uh, and, and got up to the first step and had his own problems that I'm, I'm sure I'll tell you about in a second. For me, uh, as, day, as uh, daylight came over the mountain, I was having a, a few issues with my, with my oxygen. It was, didn't feel as though it was quite getting the, the kick I, I, was, uh, I needed at that time. Um, went on for a little while and then found that I went from being able to see the curvature of the earth within sort of half an hour or so to be able to see 10, 20 metres. Uh, I at first assumed it was the weather coming in, but having spoken to the one person I could see within within um, 10 metres of me, he said, you know, it's gin clear, I can see forever. And obviously rubbed my goggles, wandered around for a little while, realised something must have been wrong with my eyes, um, and I made a decision to turn around. Um, for, for me, um, it was going well, and my, my oxygen mask failed. And, and I, I radioed put on the, the, the comms to the rest of the team if anyone had a spare one or if indeed anyone could fix it um, couldn't, there was something wrong with one of the valves apparently, uh, not that really knew that at all that's, that's, that's the, the hypothesis once we come down and if you, you've got no, you can have as much oxygen in your tanks as you want but unless you have access to it, you have no oxygen and there were dead bodies all around us they'd run out of oxygen and I didn't have any so, you know you either get another one, you mend the one you've got, or you try your damnedest to get out of there, and that's why I, it, was, it was a no-brainer for me. I had to get down, and um, so I turned around somewhere between the first and the second step, 
and uh, you, you're fully into the death zone and uh, just try to get down as quick as I can and fortunately got back to safety. Now here's the thing, uh, Josh, obviously I've known you for, for many years, I don't know you Keith, but I recognise the animal that you are and maybe before you'd experienced Everest, if you'd been told you wouldn't summit, you'd see that as some kind of failure, you'd maybe beat yourself up over it and be hell-bent on doing it again, but now that you've experienced Everest and you've, you've come down alive, which is the, the main thing, I think you see that in a very, very different light and it's very comforting to see that you're both more than satisfied with, with what you did and the, and the life experience that you got out of it. I think that you're right and I think that, as I said to earlier, yeah, it's this experience you go to and, and the weather may have come in. We were very lucky to get a weather break. We were looking at down at base camp and not even having the chance to get up to the summit anywhere near it. So we had that break. Um, that said, if something lets you down which is entirely outside your own control, then you need to take you have to take solace in that. And that's why hand on heart, I, sort of went, you know, I, I know I would have got there, and not that I was going really well. And I think because of that, you can take comfort in that. And if you can't, then, then you shouldn't be in the mountains because that's the, the fickle nature of, of luck. And the same for you, Keith? Yeah, yeah I think an experience like that especially with the, the perceived failure in effect we didn't make the summit it, it certainly prompts a lot of reflection and introspection when we get back down first of all you're, you're beating yourself up about whether it's something that we could have done in preparation or whether we would made the wrong choice or decision but over a, a couple of days and a, and a few beers we, um, we justified it within ourselves and realized that actually there's nothing more we could have done on that day you need a lot of things to go right um, and we were we were lacking some um, so we're content with how it went, even if we, we regret not having been to the summit. Well, that, that's the way it goes, but it was an amazing effort by, by both you guys. And, and lastly, I think it's very important that we, we just remind people that you were talking tonight here at the RGS, raising funds for combat stress. And perhaps you'd like to very quickly explain why you were raising funds for combat stress and what combat stress is all about. Well, I'm sure Keith will give you a military uh, perspective in a second. I sat on the board of the enemy within Peel um, just recently, and particularly off the back of counterinsurgency warfare. Um, this aspect of post-traumatic stress disorder and various other mental illnesses brought on by um, some of the horrors of warfare uh, has really become a lot more public recently. And if you look at some of the statistics of the amount of people who suffer from it, and also the time period for which, on average, most people wait to get treatment, which is 14 years, you, know, you realise that these guys put their lives on the line, and often you know, some of them lose their lives and lose their limbs to protect the freedoms we take for granted. I think the least, you can do, the least we can do is try and you know, be there as a support network and do what we can to support them when, when they come back and need help because otherwise it's not just in terms of the implications for the, for the soldiers themselves but it's also their families and all their loved ones around them. And I assume Keith that you, you're even closer to this particular subject. Yeah, yeah, everything Josh says is absolutely correct and I, I think uh, understandably a lot of the, the media attention uh, and perhaps uh, therefore a lot of the public attention and the charitable donations end up going to some of the more overt injuries that you get, the, the amputees and the like, uh, which is understandable, but you've also got these other people with more covert injuries, if you like, that equally require treatment uh, to, to help themselves and reintegrate back into society. Uh, and, and I think sometimes it's worth backing the, the smaller charities that are doing equally valuable work um, alongside the, the bigger and better funded ones. Well, gentlemen, uh, welcome back to sea level. It's not warm, but it's a damn sight warmer than it was where you were. Uh, so many congratulations about what you did at Everest, sincerely, and also many congratulations tonight where, speaking at the RGS, you've just summited another big mountain. <laughs>